Good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Locker, and I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator here at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Thank you so much for joining us for this Museum at Eldridge Street virtual program, where we will be discussing eliminated Ketubot marriage contracts with Judaica curator, historian, and appraiser Sharon Lieberman Mintz. Um, I have turned on live captioning for accessibility, which is powered by artificial intelligence, so please forgive any mistakes that you may see. Um, we will be having a Q&A at the very end, where I will enable you to unmute yourselves if there's time and ask um, our presenter any questions that you may have. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to leave your questions in the chat, um, and I could begin with those questions um, when we get to the Q&A section. Just going to go on to the next slide here. Um, before we begin, I'd like to mention some exciting upcoming events that we have going on at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Um, for those of you who are new to us and to our programming, um, we are um, a museum located in the historic Eldridge Street Synagogue. Um, built in 1887, we were the first grand synagogue built by Eastern European Jews in the U.S. Um, and this grand building was nearly lost to neglect in the mid 20th century before our massive restoration project returned the space to its former glory and for public use. Um, I'd like to highlight some of our upcoming programming, um, which you can find listed on our website at eldridgestreet.org events. Some of our upcoming in-person programming includes three of our signature walking tours, our activism on the Lower East Side walking tour, where you will learn all about the struggle for, for women's rights, educational opportunities, and economic equality that left a permanent mark on our city and on our country. Um, we also have our um, very fun and very famous all of a kind family tour where you and your family can follow in the footsteps of the beloved sisters depicted in Sydney Taylor's classic book, All of a Kind Family. Um, and we have our classic Jewish Lower East Side walking tour where you will have the opportunity to walk through the neighborhood with one of our senior educators and learn all about the turn of the century and the hundred year history of the Jewish Lower East Side. Um, welcome to all of our newcomers coming in. Um, if you can't make it in person down to the Lower East Side, we also offer virtual programming, um, just like the one you're attending right now. Our um, mo most recent one is actually a virtual tour of the Lower East Side. So if you can't join us in person, please join us virtually. And again, you can see all of our programming at eldridgestreet.org slash events. Um, whether it's for a program or not, we would love to see you here at the museum. Um, we are located at 12 Eldridge Street in Manhattan's Chinatown, and we are open every single day except Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and I'd like to now welcome our speaker for this evening, Sharon Lieberman Mintz. Ms. Mintz is the Curator of Jewish Art at the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and she specializes in the art of Hebrew illuminated manuscripts and rare printed books. Over the course of 36 years at the library, she has curated more than 50 exhibitions and co-authored 11 exhibition catalogs. And since 1985, she's also served as the Senior Specialist for Judaica and Hebraica at Sotheby's. In that capacity, she has cataloged and appraised decorated Hebrew manuscripts, books, ketubot, and megillo for Jewish sales world, worldwide for over two decades. Um, welcome, Sharon, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Maya. It's such a pleasure to be uh, a part of this program. Um, I'm coming to you live from Israel, actually, which is, um, which is fun. Uh, the, the, we've chosen today to present uh, my lecture on the art and history of decorated ketubot because Today, still in New York and across America in any event, is Tuba Av. And Tuba Av is the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Av. And it is a very appropriate day uh, to be lecturing on Ketubot, Jewish marriage contracts, because it is both an ancient and a modern holiday. Originally, it was a post biblical day of joy, and it served as a matchmaking day for women in the Second Temple period. And today is sort of the equivalent of Valentine's Day and comparable to Sadie Hawkins Day. And the first mention that we have of the date of Tuba Av, the 15th of the month of Av, is in the Mishnah, a rabbinic text that was compiled and edited by the end of the second century. And in the Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel is quoted as saying, there were no better, by which he means happier days for the people of Israel then the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur, since on these days, the daughters of Israel go out dressed in white and dance in the vineyards. And they say, young men, consider whom you choose to be your wife. And there's kind of a lot of background history about the day of, of Tuba Av and the holiday. Uh, but I, I chose it as the date of this lecture. I guess Maya chose it with me because I wanted to uh, present 
marriage contracts ketubot. Uh, in contemporary times, when the last toast is made in honor of a newly engaged couple, planning for the wedding begins. Halls are booked, caterers are called, invitations, dresses, flowers are ordered, and the couple uh, begins to consider purchasing a ketubah, a marriage contract. And many couples uh, choose a standard text and spend most of their time thinking about the design and the artwork. But a millennia ago, this was not the case. The text was of chief importance and the design was an afterthought. And this evening, uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are, um, I would like to explore with you how the creation of Ketubot changed over the centuries. And I want to examine the social and historical context that produced magnificently decorated Ketubot over the last 400 years. So Ketuba literally means that which is written. It is a traditional term for a Jewish marriage contract. The text of the Ketuba specifies the groom's obligation to his bride during the marriage, as well as the monies due to the wife in the event of divorce or the death of her spouse. And the Ketubah has an ancient history. It was created in order to protect the wife. And we find related documents are dating as early as the mid fifth century before the common era. And these were found among the writings of the Jewish military colony in Elephantine, Egypt. Uh, but the Ketubah as we know it today, dates from Talmudic period between the first and the fifth centuries. And as such, the Ketubah is traditionally written in Aramaic because that was the lingua franca of that period. And it was then that the uh, rabbis codified the conditions of this prenuptial document to protect the wife and her offspring. Uh, and though parts of the Ketubah were fixed by legal principle and custom, other parts reflected, uh, other parts of the text reflected uh, the particular needs of an individual woman and also reflected the customs of her community. Now, originally, uh, Jewish marriage consisted of two ceremonies. In fact, it still does. There's the first ceremony, which is known as betrothal, kiddushin or erosin, and uh, the second ceremony of nuptials, which is nisuin. During the first ceremony of kiddushin, a ketubah uh, uh, is given to the bride along with a ring or another object and two blessings of kiddushin are recited. Originally, after several months to a year, the second ceremony of the suin or nuptials took place, which included a chuppah and the sheva brachot, the seven blessings. In the Middle Ages, however, in the communities of Ashkenaz, which are kind of France and Germany, they began to celebrate the betrothal and nuptials in one ceremony because an interval of several months was inconvenient. And this practice soon spread to other European communities, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and then around the world. In order to mark the end of the betrothal ceremony and the beginning of the nuptial ceremony, the ketubah, the marriage contract, was read out loud. And this demarcated the two parts of the wedding ceremony. Although all marriages include a ketubah, wealthy families distinguished their social status by lavishly decorating these marriage contracts. So in addition to offering, offering a really fascinating look at the lives of individual couples, decorated and illustrated marriage contracts in the early modern era provide a wealth of information concerning the artistic creativity and cultural interactions and the social history of the Jewish communities in which they were created. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to show you uh, what you're looking at here is one of the earliest and one of the rarest um, decorated Hebrew marriage documents. It's actually a fragment thereof. And uh, as is noted, it is from uh, Egypt uh, from the 12th century, the early 12th century. And it was discovered in the Ben Ezra synagogue of Cairo, where there was a Gniza, a repository that contained thousands of documents that were discarded. And these, this repository, the Gniza, 
was technically supposed to contain um, documents that were of a sacred nature, things with God's name, sacred texts, but the Cairo Geniza in the Ben Ezra synagogue was a real treasure trove. It contained also secular writings and documents written in both Hebrew and in Judeo-Arabic. So um, Hebrew characters, but Arabic text. And you know, every aspect of Jewish life uh, in the early medieval period is represented uh, amongst the documents of the Cairo Geniza. And this ketubah is a fragment which contains several lines of blessings and good wishes. And it forms a celebratory a preamble to the actual ketubah contract, which we don't have. This is kind of just the top of what would have been a larger document. Uh, and there, there are very few, there, there are two, three, such documents from the Cairo Geniza with decoration. There, there are other marriage contracts with the Cairo Geniza, but decorated are very few. Next slide, please. Um, the earliest complete Jewish marriage contracts with all the texts uh, are found uh, from, come to us from medieval Spain. And here you see two such examples. On the left of your screen is a Ktuba from Tudela, Spain, from the year 1300. And only a very few handful of decorated Ktuba have survived from medieval Spain. Usually they've come down to us found in the bindings of books um, uh, where, where scholars have sort of opened up the bindings and, and found these documents that were used to strengthen uh, the boards of the books. And this is one of the earliest contracts. And Tudela was a city in the northern uh, kingdom, northern Spain in the kingdom of Navarre. And what you see is a very simple, repetitive, ornamental border of geometric patterns set very closely to the text uh, with decorative birds in either corner. And this is uh, one of the only early examples with figurative imagery, with actual birds. And the uh, contract the Ketubah on the right is from the island of Mallorca, uh, and it is before 1428. We don't have the exact year. We only have the date, Friday, the 11th of Kislev. And what we know about Mallorca is Mallorca was an island uh, off the eastern coast of Spain under the control of the kingdom of Aragon. Uh, the Jews there were dispersed in 1435 after a blood libel in 1432, and the last year, that the 11th of Kislev fell out on a Friday was 1428. And you can, so that's why we know that this has to be before 1428 because after that, the community was dispersed. And you can see the red and green palmettes are set right up against the text. And this uh, document too is preserved in a binding that was found in the library in Barcelona. Now, this decoration served a very important functional purpose. These marriage contracts uh, had significant financial implications. And what they did was when you put a border around the text, it sort of said, ad can veloyoter, this is where the document ends, these are the obligations, and the families could not tamper with the text. And we actually have the, in the writings of Shimon ben Semach Duran, who was a late 14th, early 15th century rabbinic authority who had fled from Spain to Algiers after 1391. He said that the borders of Ketubot should be filled with biblical verses and decorations so that no new stipulations could be added. So it's not only to beautify uh, the text, but also it's to ensure the integrity uh, of this financial document. So next slide, please. How do we get from these modestly decorated uh, ketubas uh, and marriage contracts to the sumptuously ornamented documents, uh, which we begin to see in the 17th century? And here we're actually looking at something that was created in Venice in 1749. What happened? Uh, we know that when the Jews uh, were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula, from Spain in 1492 and from Portugal in 1497, they settled in such places as Italy, the Ottoman Empire and North Africa. And these Jews who fled from the Iberian Peninsula were known as Sfaradim and they maintained, they maintained their customs 
And we find that decorated kibbutz begin to be produced in every major center of what's known as the Sephardic diaspora. And what we're looking at here from the 18th century, we've jumped a little bit ahead, but I chose this elaborate decorated contract because it is very emblematic of Sephardi Ketubot as they appear in Italy. And we have a, a good number of profusely decorated uh, contracts that look like this. And I wanna take a bit of a deep dive into what's going on on this document. So first of all, if you look at this document, you will see that it contains a significant body of information. We have the date, the place, the family names, the money. Um, these are all normative things that you find in the text of a ketubah. On this document, there are two parts of the of, of, of text. On the right, you see the marriage contract, the ketubah, and the engagement articles the Tanaim, as they're known in Hebrew, are on the left. And the engagement articles uh, typically contain the contents of the dowry as well as special stipulations. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at a decorative program uh, that is highly elaborate and characteristic of Venice uh, and the surrounding environments. And this is a kind of a contract that we begin to see uh, in the middle of the 17th century. And this is about a hundred years into this um, design. And let's take it apart. Uh, so first of all, you'll notice that there is an architectural framework. There are these two columns on either side and the architecture reflects the new home that the couple will build. Um, and uh, you see uh, so sort of the, the architectural design um, reflects the idea that, these, that the couple is building a new home in Israel. Above the architectural design, we have an intricate love knot. And a love knot is kind of this looping design, um, sort of midway center in the document. And the love knot is something that has no beginning or end. And it's a frequent design element in Italian ktubot. It's borrowed from Italian folk culture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, I'm bringing you a close up because in each of the corners, uh, we see four implements from the ancient temple of Jerusalem, and they are prominently placed uh, on the ketubah. And uh, let's see what we have here. We have uh, going from the right to the left, the kior, which is the wash basin uh, for the Levites to wash the hands of the priests. We have the uh, menorah, the candelabrum. We have uh, going from right to left, the, um, the holy ark of the covenant. Uh, with the cherubim, the kruvim on top, and all the way at left here, we have the uh, uh, the showbread, um, the the uh, showbread uh, table uh, where the holy loaves were placed. So why would you put this on a ketuba? This is a suggesting uh, they the, number one these implements express the hope for messianic redemption, right? Just as we hope the temple will, rebuilt, re, will be rebuilt. Um, it's also suggesting to the couple that they build their new home modeled on the principles uh, of Jewish culture and tradition as expressed uh, in the holiness of the temple. And of course, uh, every time uh, a, a Jewish um, marriage takes place, uh, it brings us one step closer uh, to messianic uh, redemption. So that is what you're seeing over there. Uh, the floral border uh, can also contains 12 signs of the zodiac. Next slide, please. And here you see, you need the next slide. I've brought you a close up because you actually, you know, sometimes the signs of the zodiac, which appear frequently on Italian ketubot, are very prominent. Here they're kind of nestled within the um, within the floral border. They're a little hard to pick out. So I wanted to show, give, bring you a close up. Now you may be wondering why are there twelve signs of the zodiac uh, on a 
on a marriage contract. Uh, you might understand if one or two are there for the specific side of the bride and the groom, but why bring all 12 uh, zodiac signs here and why are they such a common feature in decorated Italian marriage contracts? Um, well, the Hebrew word for the sign of the zodiac is mazal. And the plural for that is mazalot. So here, the full assemblage of all 12 signs of the zodiac functioned as a visual expression of the good wishes extended to the couple. Um, these contracts were created at a time I call it the pre-antibiotic era, uh, which means that they didn't have penicillin and they didn't have antibiotics. And if someone caught strep throat or some other really nasty uh, uh, infection, you could die. You didn't have antibiotics to treat it. And so Jews actually, as, as people around the world, believed that the stars influenced uh, their lives. Uh, this is less common nowadays because we do have antibiotics and we're living in a scientific world. And so we bless the couple with mazal tov. Nowadays we say mazal tov, we think it just means congratulation. But actually these ketubot had the mazalot, the stars there, because we hope that their wedding and subsequent marriage would be under a good sign and omen. So the images are the visual representation of the Hebrew mazal tov. Uh, in this document, in the Tanaim, the conditions of engagement, which are written at left, the bride and the groom have an interesting stipulation, which you don't find on most marriage contracts. They agree to conduct their mutual life with love and affection without hiding or concealing anything from each other. And furthermore, they will control their possessions equally. However, it goes on to state, in case of a quarrel, God forbid, between them, they will follow the customs of the Ashkenazim in Venice for the matter. And this stipulation was probably inserted because this contract celebrates a marriage uh, between a Svardi bride and an Ashkenazi groom. And so they're talking about whose customs are going to, uh, to be the ones who are followed and uh, here, I guess the groom is kind of asserting a certain amount of control. Next slide, please. Now you may be wondering who was creating the art on these beautiful uh, marriage contracts. And this contract, which, is, uh, which was celebrating a wedding in Mantua, uh, took place on Friday in 1737. It was very popular. Uh, in the early modern period to celebrate weddings on Friday. Um, and then the Shabbat feast, the wedding feast would be um, at the same time as the Shabbat feast. And uh, the, it's an interesting thing today in Israel, people go, are going back to celebrating weddings on Friday. I don't think that's caught on that much in the States, but it's definitely done in Israel. And uh, this marriage contract from Mantra gives us some very interesting historical information. In the medieval and Renaissance periods, the Jews were not allowed into the artistic guilds for the most part throughout Europe. In Spain, it seems to be that they were, but for the most part in Germany and Italy, the Jews were not allowed into the guilds. So in the medieval period, Hebrew manuscripts were primarily illustrated by Christian artists. This is, there were Jewish artists, but a lot of the artwork was done by Christians um, who worked uh, to some degree under the supervision of Jewish scribes and patron. By the 18th century, we have more evidence of Jews who were able to work in the arts, and it would seem that these marriage contracts were decorated uh, in a colorful but uh, not always sophisticated style, and they were the work of Jewish artists. They're very rarely signed. But here, all the way at the bottom, and I should have brought you a close-up, but I didn't, um, it's signed by the artist and scribe Abraham Elijah, the son of Eliezer Fano. So we have very specific evidence that this 18th century marriage contract for Mantua was decorated and written by a Jewish artist. Next slide, please. 
uh, in the following marriage contract uh, from Mantua from 1689, we have visual evidence that it was almost certainly illustrated by a Christian. And this is gonna become clear when we look at the imagery. Now, this is interesting. This is a marriage contract which is engraved, uh, the design is engraved onto parchment. Uh, parchment is, is uh, what most marriage contracts were written uh, and uh, illustrated on in Europe, uh, as we'll see uh, later on in, in North Africa and in Baghdad and Iran, they were done on paper, but in, in Europe, they were done on parchment. It's very hard to print on parchment. So this is an engraving and we have five extant copies of this of this same border used as a marriage contract. And I wanna unpack this very interesting um, uh, imagery that we find on this contract. So number one, at the top are images of Adam and Eve, the first wedded couple reclining between uh, the tree of knowledge. And then uh, I've brought you close-ups here and I think they're going to appear in the next slide as well, but one minute. Um, in the ovals to the right and the left, we find depictions of God in human form, creating the sun and moon and breathing life into Adam. And maybe go to the next slide, please. Let's see, Maya, if you, okay. And, and we can see, um, this, this very interesting imagery. Let's see if I can pull it up here. So we have God in human form and God creating Adam and Eve, right? Uh, and, and, and Eve from Adam's rib all the way at bottom. And this, a word about, about imagery in Jewish art. For a long time, Christian scholars said, ah, oh, Jews can't have art because of the second commandment. But actually, the second commandment prohibits um, the worship of imagery. It, it prohibits the creation of imagery in order to worship it. And the rabbis uh, interpreted the second commandment not necessarily as a prohibition against imagery, but as a prohibition against the worship of imagery. So, Two-dimensional imagery was considered okay. Three-dimensional imagery was slightly more problematic because you may come to worship a sculpture. Um, however, the second about the rabbis completely prohibited the image of divine representation. So God in human form is is completely prohibited according to all rabbinic authorities. And the fact that we see here is a pretty strong indication that the artist was a Christian. We don't have this kind of imagery in Jewish art. Next slide, please. Here we have some other images in this, um, in this slide. So God confronting at right, God confronting Adam and Eve and uh, angel chasing them out of the garden and uh, Adam and Eve working the soil. This is very um, typical illustrations of the biblical episodes of this period. Next slide, please. Now we have some complicated uh, illustrations that we wouldn't necessarily expect to find on a marriage contract. So at right, we have the image of, um, let's see, which is it right and which is it left? Samson and Delilah at left and Joseph and Potiphar's, uh, Joseph sort of escaping the bed of Potiphar's wife at right, right? She tried to seduce him and he sort of runs away at the last minute, gets thrown into jail because she accuses him of seducing, seducing her. But uh, let's continue onwards. Next slide. At the bottom of the document, uh, we see some more interesting imagery. We see uh, in the top over here, the, the top, well, the middle uh, 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 image, we see an image of the binding of Isaac. Okay, fine, that shows covenant. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that um, episode sort of was one of the fundamental ways in which God you know, kind of created a covenant with, uh, with uh, Abraham, that's, that's okay. But coming up after that, we have some very interesting imagery. We have um, David and spying Bathsheba, right? And then he sort of takes her for his wife. We have on the bottom register, 
Lot and his two daughters, very complicated imagery, and Susanna and the elders, right? That's what's going on here. So three, three really unusual images that you may not expect to find in a Jewish marriage contract. And I think we don't understand why they were necessarily included. It seemed that the artist had a strong interest in depictions of the power of women over men, as well as illicit relationships in the Bible and their consequences. And Susanna and the Elder is a story that's popular in Christian tradition. Um, she's spied upon by these elders. They try to, um, they basically want to rape her and she refuses and they, they it's a long story, but basically she escapes unscathed um, due to her modesty. And given this unusual composition and the selection of episodes and motifs, including the depiction of God's images, it's pretty clear that the artist was a Christian, but Jews are willing to use this document um, five times. We have it uh, in Jewish marriages um, from 1689, 1690, 1693, and 1706. And you may ask, what did the rabbis have to say about the use of this kind of a wedding contract? And it's a very interesting question because who should sign as the witness on this contract? But Judah Briel and Chaim Nortzi, Judah Briel was the chief rabbi of Mantua at the time. So obviously um, he is, he's on board uh, with the use of this contract uh, to um, document and celebrate this Jewish wedding. Uh, so while we assume that most of these contracts were decorated by Jews, it's clear that some of them uh, still uh, were, were using uh, Christian artists to decorate the contracts. When the Jews were adapting uh, uh, and, and adopting the art of the country in which they lived, when we find uh, marriage contracts from Italy, the Jewish artists were using um, imagery that you would find current in Italian art, secular art of the time. Next slide, please. I'm gonna bring you uh, two examples of that, one from Italy. And this is a marriage contract uh, from Rome from 1836. And what we find is that the Jewish artist has incorporated secular imagery uh, into the decorative programs. So this is not biblical imagery. Uh, what we find over here is the adaption of allegorical imagery that was popular throughout Christian Europe in the 17th and 18th century. What was going on? Christian artists produced guidebooks, which carefully pre presented a repertory of allegories depicting vices and virtues, emotions, and moral and intellectual values. And the most popular of these was a guidebook entitled Iconologia, and it was created by Cesare Ripa. It was first published in Rome in 1593 without illustrations, and then continuously reprinted with engravings. So here, if an artist, uh, primarily a Christian artist, as who their audience was, wanted to show uh, vices and virtues in their art, they would know exactly what the right allegory is. Here, uh, I'm showing you in this document, contains two female allegorical figures in uh, the center of the side borders. And it, it shows uh, on the right border, an image of victory, this is the emblem of victory, holding a branch and a crown. What's going on? The artist Judaicizes the secular imagery, uh, which is apparently victory is not necessarily associated with marriage, uh, but the artist uses uh, the imagery of victory, which is uh, a green olive branch. Uh, and, it's, and the sentence, the Hebrew verse underneath it is, uh, may they delight in an abundance of peace. That's a verse from Psalms 37, chapter 37, verse 11. And the crown in her left hand is uh, an allusion to the words from Proverbs chapter four, verse nine, may they crown you with a glorious diadem. So um, you have a, a Christian uh, image of a victory kind of Judaicized and used in the marriage contract. The image in the left niche houses Speranza, that's an image of hope. And you see here a woman holding a large black anchor, which is the symbol of hope and safety. And this idea is emphasized 
in the carefully selected verse uh, that appears above here, fear of the Lord is a stronghold. And so it's kind of um, a stronghold. They're using an anchor to mean a, a stronghold and this idea of, of, of the ability that the, the marriage should be steadfast and but that one needs to fear in the Lord to, to make it so, I guess. This is a verse from Proverbs, uh, chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide is a very interesting piece of material culture. Uh, most of these marriage contracts are from the library of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, and um, at bottom, you see a little remnant of a ribbon uh, that was still folded into the uh, parchment because these documents, interestingly enough, were very expensive. They were, they were produced by artists and uh, they often spent a lot of money on them, so much so that the rabbis actually created laws that kind of um, said you can only spend 15 florins on a marriage contract. They're called sumptuary laws. They didn't want people to spend more than that amount on a marriage contract, but you know, they're not hung on the walls of homes as they are nowadays. They were rolled up with the ribbon that you see on the end of this document here and uh, tucked away. Uh, and hopefully they were no never needed for use, um, but you needed to be able to have them in your home. And uh, according to rabbinic law, one is not supposed to uh, live in a home without knowing where the marriage contract is in that home. So you're supposed to keep it with you always. In the next slide, uh, is this is kind of an interesting parallel because this is a ketubah from the Netherlands. Uh, this ketubah is from The Hague. It's from the year 1729, and it celebrates the wedding of Aaron, the son of Joseph de Pinto, to his cousin, Sarah, the daughter of Jacob de Pinto. The de Pinto family was a very wealthy family. But uh, in this ketubah, we see an interesting phenomenon. It's an engraved border, uh, which was then hand colored. And, and this is, this engraved border is the style of decorated marriage contracts used by members of the Sephardic Jewish community, uh, first in the Netherlands, and then throughout the Sephardic diaspora, beginning in the 1650s. So I think, but this hasn't been proven, that um, the rabbis of the community were trying to sort of control how much money was spent on ketubah documents. And they said, okay, we're gonna create one border and everybody has to use this same border. It gets updated over time. It's a copper plate engraving. In this particular example, um, it's been embellished with color. So it's engraved in black and white and then embellished with color. And this, this same border design is used with updates for over 200 years um, by members, really it's of the Portuguese Jewish community throughout the Western uh, Sephardic diaspora. And what's going on here? I wanna take a look at, uh, please uh, go to the next slide because there are two very interesting images on the top border, the image on the right depicts an elegantly attired bridal couple with their hands clasped. And in the image on the left, a woman is shown with a baby in her arms with a second child uh, standing by her side. And this image of a woman uh, uh, sort of uh, holding a baby uh, um, uh, is an image that represents personification of charity. It's, it's a popular motif in Baroque art of kindness, of overflowing love and it represents the ideals of marriage. And over the course of two centuries, when this same imagery of, of, of the bridal couple on the right-hand side and the image of charity on the left, um, over the course of two centuries, the images of the way the, the, the bridal couple uh, was clothed was updated as the clothing uh, changes design and style uh, over the decades. And uh, this this ketubah uh, has several features that we find on uh, on Sephardic ketubot. For example, in this ketubah, the bridegroom assigns here at bottom in Portuguese. So there's a lot that can be said about this ketubah, but I want to take you to other parts of the world before we end. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
in the second half of the 18th century, it became popular in Near Eastern Jewish communities to embellish ketubot as well. And here you're looking at a ketubah from Baghdad from 1764. And what's fascinating is that the way in which they're decorating this ketubah is with paper that was printed with elaborate floral designs. But, and this is one of, this is the earliest known decorated marriage contract from Baghdad. But what's surprising about this is that the brocade paper, that's how it's known, that's used here and in other Baghdadi ketubot and also in the contracts from Damascus was produced in Augsburg. We know exactly who produced this paper. It was uh, Marx Leonard Kaufman the Elder who lived between 1735 and 1785. So we have a ketubah from Baghdad being embellished by what's known as brocade paper um, and the circuit that was created in Augsburg and the circuitous route whereby decorative paper from Central Europe came to the Near East is unknown, but surely indicative of the commercial ties that bound these far-flung Jewish communities together. Next slide, please. This is another example of a ketubah. This, this one, we were looking at a ketubah from Baghdad, Iraq. This is from Isfahan uh, in Iran. Persia in those days, and it is celebrating a marriage that took place uh, on Friday, March 20th, 1885. And this ketubah was attributed to a known Isfahani ketubah artist, Moses, the son of Yeshua. And it is a decorative program that was very, very popular in ketubot from Isfahan. You have the cypress tree flanked by two rampant lions with a personified sun rising behind the lions. And what's fascinating is that the motif of two rampant lions flanking a cypress tr tree, the lions with the sun is Persia's venerated national symbol since antiquity. We find it appearing on Persian coins from the first century of the common era. And it was also used uh, in and up through the 19th century. And this is a symbol the use of the symbol on the part of Isfahan's jewelry is an expression of their deep identification with their long time um, home in uh, Persia. It's, it's their way, it's like, it's like Jews putting American flags on their ketubah. And in fact, uh, let's take a look, and next slide please, of a fairly early uh, ketubah that was decorated in New York City and celebrates a wedding between Nathan, the son of Yechiel, and the bride is Deborah, the daughter of uh, Eliezer, on September 20th, 1863. This is a very, very beautiful 19th century American ketubah. And we actually know the artist, his name was Tzemach Davidson, and he signs his name at bottom, and he planned every element of the text and decoration and the layout of the ketubah differs from uh, many others that we have because we have these interlocking cir circles uh, symbolizing the marital union. And you have the clasped hands um, of the bride and the groom. And the text of the ketubah is written inside the circles. And there are very interesting elements here, uh, which if you go to the next slide, I will uh, I'll elaborate on. So here uh, at top, we see two clocks. We have two columns, architectural columns, as we saw in the earlier ketubah from Venice, very typical uh, uh, motif, uh, decorating the building, decorating ketubot, it symbolizes the building of the new home. But clocks are not things we find often on ketubot. In fact, we find them very rarely on ketubot. And this is one of the two or three examples that I know of. And you can see, we spent a long time thinking about what, what the significance of the clocks here is. And if you look very careful, carefully at the Roman numerals, you will see that both clocks are set to exactly the same time. And if you look carefully, you'll see that that time is 613. And 613 is a number that reminds traditional Jews of the 613 commandments and the inclusion 
of this motif in the context of a wedding is again talking about the establishment of this new household in Israel uh, should be based on the traditions of Jewish life and culture. Um, and it's, it's appropriate to put them on the top of the columns. Uh, next slide, please. This is one of my favorite documents. This is a printed document. Uh, it celebrates a wedding uh, in New York City uh, in 1911. And it really, the, the, the text has been overshadowed by a very elaborate decorative scheme. Uh, at the center, a pair of parted red curtains, uh, sort of suggestive of the Jewish marriage canopy, a chuppah. And there's a dramatic cutout frame for a picture of the bride and groom. Here we don't have it, but in other uh, examples of this uh, ketubah, this printed uh, uh, ketubah, there, is, there are pictures, photographs of the bride and groom. The text is in Hebrew, Aramaic, and English. Uh, and uh, the precise location of the ceremony is printed right at center. It is Central Palace Hall, 6668 Sheriff Street. And this was once described as the headquarters of love because there were many wedding halls on New York's Lower East Side on Sheriff Street. I think this street no longer exists, um, but uh, we, could, we could bring it into the Elder Street tours at some point to show where it might have been. It's probably featured on, on, uh, on older maps. And the proprietor of the hall was a professor, um, Abraham Hachman. Next slide, please. And here he is. Uh, he was known as the Wizard of the East Side. And he was a very, very colorful character. He was a self-proclaimed prophet. And here on the right, you see a booklet which publicized his expertise in mind reading and dream interpretation and astrology and palmistry. And he used these skills to predict the future, uh, to recover lost or stolen property. But he's most famously known for locating husbands who had deserted their wives and children. And we find articles uh, in the Yiddish press at the time of how he predicts where these husbands will be and the police then go and arrest them and uh, make them pay alimony. And he had this wedding hall. So it was kind of, you know, a twofer. If you got married in his hall, should you, God forbid, ever need his skills, he would be there for you. Um, there's a lot more to say about Abraham Hachman, but I think we'll leave that for another Eldred Street um, uh, lecture. The last slide that I wanna show here, next slide, please brings us up to more or less the contemporary period. And this is a tuba that was created by a very famous contemporary artist, Archie Grenot. It's actually a, a layered paper cut. Um, and he uh, is an artist who now lives in Jerusalem. He's known for his magnificently, intricately uh, created paper cuts. And this ketubah was created especially for the collection of the Library of the Jewish Theological a seminary, it was actually never used, um, but Granote, so because he created it, especially for the library, it's kind of, it's not filled in. He developed his own personal style and technique of multiple layers of paper cut. And um, he uses this technique on Ketubot and other uh, Jewish uh, ritual and liturgical items. Um, and according to the artist, the design reflects the centrality of Jerusalem. And he uses delicate designs inspired by the famous sixth century Madaba map uh, found on the floor in Transjordan, which is uh, detailing a Byzantine Jerusalem in its center. And the centrality of importance of Jerusalem are, are emphasized in the round cutout inscriptions that go around the text, because rather than using biblical verses, uh, Archie Granote selects lines by two Jerusalem poets. Uh, the upper verse is by Elsie Lasker Schuler who lived from 1896 to 1945, and it reads, Jerusalem is the observatory of the world to come, a window to the heavens. And the lower text is by Zelda Mishkovsky, who lived between 1914 and 1984, and her text evokes the magnetic power of Jerusalem to overwhelm the senses. So it's this idea um, which is, which is, uh, you know, we break a glass at a ketubah, we say that we will remember Jerusalem 
above our chiefest joy. Sometimes uh, the breaking of the glass symbolizes uh, the sorrow over the destruction of the temple. And, um, and so this idea of, of Jerusalem kind of embodied within the art of Ketubot is something that you find here in a, in a very modern sense. And with this Ketuba, we have traveled through eight centuries and through many European countries and Ketuba decoration continues to flourish. And I thank you for the opportunity to present the history of this splendid legacy of Jewish art on Tu Ba'av, the day that celebrates Jewish matrimony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was amazing. Um, I especially loved your Lower East Side story. I had no idea there was that personality on our in our oh, neighborhood back then. <laughs> he was a hoot. Um, he's been written up very well uh, by Eddie Portnoy. And if you Google Eddie Portnoy and uh, and Abraham Hachman, you will find a whole wonderful article that uh, Eddie did on him. So awesome. we will have to include that in our in one of our love and courtship yeah. stories. We do for some some uh, some holidays on the Lower East Side. Um, I have some questions in the chat that I'd love to get to before I allow folks to unmute themselves and and see if anyone wants to raise their hands and ask questions verbally. Um, we have a question from Beryl who asks if generally the Ketubot that you tend to see over the years um, throughout history tend to be more designed for the couple, or if they are standardized, or you know that a couple re would receive options. Um, uh, so there tend to be, nowadays, Ketubot are designed specifically with emblems that are meaningful to the couple. Um, however, in, in the earlier periods, there were standard, there were more standard designs. Sometimes they have implements in the temple. Uh, sometimes they have the city of Jerusalem on top. And, and the designs tended to um, reflect what was current in the city at that time. So in Italy, you can actually look at Ketubot and say, ah, that's Ancona, and that's the Veneto region, and that's Rome, and, and it reflects less the couple. Ah, but there is one, there's one phenomena that we find with Ketubot decoration that does reflect the couple, which is sometimes we have in these Italian Ketubot biblical images that uh, reflect the name of the bride and the groom. So if the bride's name is Rebecca, there may be an image of Rebecca at the well. And if the groom's name is David, there may be an image of David and Goliath. And I didn't, I didn't have time to bring an example of that, but, but uh, I should have had that in my back pocket. So there is, there is sometimes customization, particularly in the Italian two boats. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, so Less if you don't so have a biblical name, you're more likely to fall into a trend um, even with the biblical name, there were it's it's more this overarching uh, decorative schemes that you find in particular towns throughout the period. So, thank you. And then we have another question from Bob. Bob asks that if um, if a marriage results in a divorce, is there ever a notation on the ketubah? No, um, I I've I've seen sometimes you see ketubahs are cut, but that's not necessarily the case. They don't have to be cut. Um, what we do have is you find divorce documents and after the divorce is finalized, they, they cut the document so it can't be used again by a couple of the same name. There's all kinds of sort of rabbinic laws about the divorce document, but you it's not usually notated, no. And in fact, I have to say some of the contemporary documents in the JTS library uh, do, do come from divorced couples because they may as well be viewed historically as art and um and i'm happy to take them in <laughs> that's actually really that's really interesting um that that's kind of an interesting thing that people can go and they see a piece and they're like hmm, i wonder why that ended up here <laughs> that, that um, is why. Yeah. yeah we have another question from richard before we allow folks to unmute he asks about the significance of birds on ketubo and why we always see birds on ketubo so animal imagery is, is an interesting question. Sometimes it's kind of specific. In Italian Ketubot, I didn't bring one of those examples. We do find, ah, in the first one in Spain, there was there were birds there. Uh, birds, particularly peacocks in Italian Ketubot, represent this paradisal element. It's sort of the Garden of Eden, that moment sort of where the wedded couple is compared to Adam and Eve. Um, and you know, lovebirds, I suppose. There are other animal motifs. For example, in Ketubot from India, we have fish. 
uh, and and uh, and two fish. Fish are a symbol of, uh, of of fertility, and also fish have this emblem that the evil eye uh, doesn't doesn't affect fish because they're sort of under the water. They say they're kind of magical, uh, sort of protective emblems. So. You know, it could be that the birds are just decorative. It could be that they represent a paradisal element. I we don't have one for one explanations, always about why certain emblems were chosen over others. When Jerusalem appears on a ketubah, usually it's a reference to uh, the the idea of um, keeping Jerusalem above one's chiefest joy. I let Yushlaim al Rosh Simchati. Biblical imagery we understand don't always understand uh, other other animal imagery. And I think I, I had a question. You mentioned that um, it wasn't common at that time um, for people to hang their ketubot on a wall. Yes. Um, I, I am kind of surprised that the tradition to decorate ketubot so elaborately existed when they weren't hung on a wall. So so I think I didn't I didn't spell this out, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. If you have um, a couple getting married, all right, and let's say they're two very wealthy Jews from Venice, and uh, it was typical of throughout Italy to embellish uh, legal contracts, not just to vote, uh, and not just Jewish wedding, uh, legal contracts, but legal contracts aboard, uh, across the board. It, there was this urge to, to embellish, to make beautiful. So you have a document that's read very publicly uh, and a break between the ceremony. And I guess it was a little bit of a chance for them to show off. Uh, so I, I kind of sort of elided that when I said they were kind of distinguishing their social status, they were kind of showing off. You know, it was a moment for them to say, uh, we have the ability, you know, not, it's like, it's like, it, it, it's like, you know, you can arrive at your wedding ceremony with six, in a carriage drawn by six matched white horses. That's kind of what was going on. Like a, a Jewish version of the Italian cassone box that people would parade through the street to- Exactly, uh, cassone boxes were, were, were marriage boxes uh, that the dowries were often uh, contained in. They were bridal boxes. Uh, you see them often now in museums as these long uh, horizontal uh, paintings that usually reference uh, allegorical or, or, or historical weddings or, or uh, Greco-Roman. Yeah, exactly that. People have always been showing off. Yeah, I think it was a moment, that, it was a moment allowed, to show off. Always. And I, I have allowed any, everyone to unmute themselves if they would like. Um, would anyone like to raise their hand and ask a question out loud? Any takers? Um, we do have another question in the chat from Sheila. Sheila asks um, about some good resources online to learn more about Ketubot and their symbolism. Ah, okay. Well, um, the best resource is a, uh, a book by Shalom Sabar, S-A-B-A-R, which was just published and uh, by the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary. And uh, it came out, I guess, in in the fall of 2022, and it is his magnum opus. Shalom Sabar is the world's leading scholar of, of the art uh, and history of Tubot, uh, and this is his magnum opus. It's two volumes, it's 900 pages. If you Google Shalom Sabar and Ketuba, he has written extensively articles. Um, you can find all of his articles uh, for free in academia.edu. That would be a good place to go looking. Um, there's also the Center for Jewish Art has, has images Ketubot. The Ketubot of the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, about 550 of them are online. We are in the process of updating and enlarging all the imagery. So there's a lot of information there, um, but for one-stop shopping, Shalom Zabah. As a former catalogist at a museum, I understand how difficult all of that can be. <laughs> the digitizing process is, is very hard uh, for everybody, but I'm very happy that everyone's starting to do that all over. So so many people can have access to all these things no matter where they are. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell you like the 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 national um, Ketiv, if you do KTIV and the National Library of Israel, 
they have about 3,000 Ketubot online and one can study Ketubot from various cities and you can narrow it down. And that's a wonderful a place to go looking for, um, that's probably the best resource that because it aggregates Ketubot from collections from around the world. KTIV and the National Library of Israel, um, that's, that's a wonderful resource. Uh, the Israel Museum, the Jewish Museum, uh, all of these places have their own Ketubot online, but but like for another one-stop shop, National Library of Israel. Thank you. And then I have one last question in the chat about you personally, how you got interested in illuminated manuscripts or Ketubot in general. Uh, I uh, did an undergrad degree in art history at Barnard and a graduate degree in art history at Columbia and was particularly interested in the art of Hebrew illuminated manuscripts. And then when I became curator at the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, I don't know, around about 1986, 87, it's all a little hazy, uh, uh, I was working uh, with this extraordinary collection of Ketubot. I've uh, mounted exhibitions over the years, both at the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, and at the Jewish Museum we had separate. And um, I, I find that uh, decorated Hebrew manuscripts, Ketubot, uh, Megillot, decorated Esther scrolls, illuminated medieval manuscripts, decorated 18th century manuscripts, are this wonderful nexus between art, religion, Jewish history, culture, it's sort of everything wrapped up into one. So I, I find it a, a really fascinating uh, area to explore. And I guess I've been doing that for quite a while now. Well, that's why you're the expert and we, we had you I, here. I'm one of the experts. About it. <laughs> I've, I've been working on it for a while. And I would like to say that if anyone is interested in combining this topic with Eldridge Street, um, we do um, use our space for Ketuba signings, weddings, oh, all those beautiful one. things. So if anyone is interested or anyone knows anyone who is looking for a wonderful, beautiful venue to do that, we are definitely your place to go. So please check out our website at eldridgestreet.org to See, all, see to all of your wedding needs. Um, and um, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank Sharon so much for staying up so late for us. I think it might be 1 or 2 a.m. right now in Israel. So 2 a.m. It's okay. I'm a night owl. Anyone who knows me knows thank I'm you a night so owl. Much. Thank you so much for staying up with us. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining us this evening. And have a very happy rest of your tuba of with the people that you love. Have a great evening. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, Maya. Thanks for making Bye. it possible.